Namaskar and welcome to CEC Gurukul Lectures. I am Dr. Kumar Shantanu, Associate Professor of Botany from Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi. We are undergoing uh, our discussion with a new series of lectures that is analytical techniques uh, which are applied in plant sciences. Now as far as the development and discoveries of science is concerned. Although many of the remarkable discoveries in the field of life science have been made without the application of specialized technology, but technology plays an important role in understanding new frontiers in life science. One of the remarkable developments in microscopy and imaging techniques happens to be the development and discovery of microscopy. These techniques occupy a central stage in biological as well as in material science. It provides this, uh, the advantage of being able to observe and measure form and features to reveal the variability of any biological specimen. With the help of these technology, the biological specimens could be observed either in their living form or maybe after uh, some kind of treatment or their anatomical uh, details also. With the development of more refined techniques coupled with the discovery of an array of fluorophores, it has made possible to visualize and study the cellular and subcellular components and the diverse physiological processes like protein interactions, ion transports, nutrient mobility and metabolic processes taking place inside a living cell. In light microscopy, the differential reflection, diffraction and absorption properties of different specimen are used to study the specimens. So improvements in microscopy are mainly emphasized on increasing the contrast between the specimen and the background. With the help of fluorescence microscopy, it provides a better contrast than other optical microscopy techniques. Today we are going to discuss an extended form of light microscopy where we would apply different combinations of optical instruments which will enable us to enhance the contrast between the specimen and the background. One such uh, modification or advancement in microscopy is the use of fluorescent microscopy. Now fluorescence microscopy generally comprises of uh, two specialized filter, two specialized structures called as emission filter and excitation filter. It also uses very specialized optical structure called as dichromatic mirror. The light source could be a UV light which passes through the optical fiber. Now fluorescent microscopy can be achieved by staining or tagging the target sample with fluorescence dye or with fluorescence molecules. These fluorescent dyes or fluorescence molecules they are termed as or they are also called as fluorophores. This process is done amid the non fluorescing background. On irradiation with high energy light only the fluorescence molecules emit light enabling 
to visualize only the object of interest in the dark background. Fluorescence has been described for the first time by Irish scientist Sir George G. Stokes way back in 1852 during the middle of 19th century. While working with a mineral uh, named as uh, fluor spar at the Cambridge University, he noticed that the mineral emitted red light when illuminated with blue light. As far as the fluorescence microscopes are concerned, the first fluorescence microscope were developed by German physicists Otto Hemstad and Henrik Lehmann between 1911 and 1913 as variant from the ultraviolet microscopy. Now let us try to understand the basic principles which are involved in fluorescence microscopy. To understand the principles of fluorescence microscopy, it is very important for us to get familiarized with two terms called as excitation and emission. So, what is excitation? Every molecule can observe, absorb light of certain wavelength. When these molecules are subjected to radiant energy, they absorb the energy and become excited to a higher energy state. However, some atoms or molecules after absorbing light re-radiates back the energy in the form of light within nanosecond after absorption. This physical phenomenon is known as fluorescence and it was first described by Sir George G. Stokes. So let us try to understand this process of fluorescence with the help of a diagram. So to understand this, uh, let us consider any object which has its ground state level energy which can be denoted as state 0 or S0. Now, when this substance is irradiated by a light, it absorbs that light and because of this absorption of light, the molecules get excited to a higher energy state, say S1 or state 1. In some of the molecules, the energy state can reach up to a more high level, say S2 or the state 2. Now, after very small fraction of time, this energy from a higher state or the excited state levels is emitted in the form of visible light so that the object once again comes back to ground state level. This emitted light is given back from the excited state level with a fraction of time and this fraction of time is up to an order of nanoseconds. So the wavelength with which the object has absorbed energy and the wavelength with which the object has emitted, both are different. So, this phenomenon of emitting a different wavelength of light by any object is termed as fluorescence. And as I have already told you, the time delay between the absorption and emission of the light in fluorescence is less than a microsecond. On the contrary, the phenomenon of phosphorescence occurs when the emission persists even after the excitation light has been discontinued. So, here in this diagram, we can see that the time gap between the excitation light absorption and the light which has been emitted back is much more. So, in case of fluorescence, the emitted light comes out immediately 
whereas in case of phosphorescence there is a intersystem crossing there is a transition state so from the excited energy level some part of the energy is released in the form of intersystem crossing and the molecule comes at a transition energy state and from this transition energy state that is t1 the energy is released in the form of visible light so in this pathway the amount of energy released remains almost same but the time taken is much large so even after the excitation light has been stopped the emitted light keeps on coming after certain period of time and this process is termed as phosphorescence whereas in case of fluorescence the emitted light comes only after a fraction of nanoseconds so when a molecule in their ground state absorbs light energy all the energy of the photon is transferred to the molecule the amount of energy absorbed by the molecule is inversely proportional to the wavelength of the photon and this energy can be calculated based on the stokes equation the stokes equation says e is equal to h multiplied by c upon lambda so in the stokes equation e is the amount of energy which is being absorbed this is the amount of energy which is already present in the photons of the uh, absorbed light h here represents the planck's constant whereas c represents the speed of the light and lambda represents the wavelength of light in vacuum c upon lambda can also be replaced by nu because nu is inversely proportional to the lambda for any electromagnetic wave after absorbing the energy from uh, after absorbing the energy the molecule is transferred to the higher energy state level uh, let's say state 1 however if the amount of energy absorbed is greater than the requirement to transfer to s1 state then the molecule is further transferred to a higher state let us say s2 or the state 2 the excited molecule stays at the excited state for a period on the order of nanoseconds and return to the ground state by losing the absorbed energy electrons excited at a higher orbital state in s2 or the state 2 first returns to the s1 state or state 1 this transition between the electron orbitals from s2 to s1 is also known as internal conversion so here in the diagram you can see that a molecule after absorbing the light can jump up to higher energy state s1 if the amount of energy is much more in the absorption light then the molecule can directly jump to a much higher energy state that is s2 from s2 the molecule loses some of its energy to come back to s1 by releasing some amount of energy this transition from s2 to s1 is termed as internal conversion and again from s1 state of energy the molecule loses its energy and the energy comes out in the form of a visible light and this visible light and this phenomenon of coming 
a different wavelength visible light is termed as fluorescence and the entire time taken in this process is to the tune of nanoseconds. So, the extra energy from this transition is lost through vibrational relaxation. Electrons at the S1 state then return to the ground state. If the drawback from higher energy state S1 to lower state is accompanied by the release of photon of light whose energy level is equal to the energy gap between the ground S0 and the first single state S1. So, this emitted light is nothing but fluorescence. So, now let us talk about after an, uh, having an idea of the basic principle of fluorescence, let us talk about the two very basic terms that is uh, uh, excitation spectrum and emission spectrum. So, a fluorophore, a fluorophore which is a substance which exhibits fluorescence on illumination absorbs light energy. If the energy absorbed is greater than that is necessary to excite its orbital electrons to S1, then electrons are transferred to the S1 state. A range of wavelength which energizes more than the minimum is required to transfer the orbital electron to the higher energy state S1. So, the excitation spectrum of a fluorophore is the range of wavelengths which can excite the fluorophore. Once excited, the fluorophore return to the ground state by release of photons of energy. The emitted light can be at different wavelengths. So, this range of wavelengths which are uh, the range of wavelengths of emitted photon, they are also termed as emission spectra of the fluorophore. So, if we have to compare between the transmission or the excitation spectra and emission spectra, excitation spectra is the range of wavelength which has the capability to illuminate fluorophore and uh, cause the phenomenon of fluorescence. Whereas, the emission spectra is the range of wavelengths of the light which is emitted during the process of fluorescence by fluorophores. So, this can be understood with the help of this uh, graphical representation. So, here this there are two peaks. One peak represents the excitation wavelength and the other peak represents the emission spectrum. So, excitation spectrum is represented by those wavelengths of light which will cause the fluorescence phenomenon. Whereas, the light rays emitted by the fluorophores during the process of fluorescence, they belong to a certain range of wavelength. So, that range of wavelength is called as emission spectra. Usually, the range, the difference between excitation spectra and the emission spectra is termed as Stokes shift. Stokes shift is a very crucial and a very important parameter and it is unique for every fluorophore. The emitted spectra is at a longer wavelength than the excitation spectra. This difference between the exciting and emitted wavelength is termed as Stokes shift which is very obviously named after Sir George Stokes. The shift in wavelengths 
may be attributed to the energy loss due to vibrational and internal conversions that takes place by the excited electrons. So, after having uh, developed an, uh, an understanding about the basic principles of fluorescence, let us now talk about fluorescence microscope. How these principles are used uh, in a ultraviolet microscope to uh, now renamed it as a fluorescence microscope. So, as we have already discussed, the difference in wavelength between the absorption and emission wavelength uh, or the stoke shift is a critical property that is utilized by the fluorescence microscopy. Illuminating the sample with one wavelength and filtering the emitted light to allow only the longer wavelength to visualize and thus making to see only the objects that are fluorescent against the dark background. This is the basic principle of any fluorescence microscope. This can be understood with the help of a figure which represents the light pathway in a epifluorescent microscope. So, what happens is with the help of a light source, the light is passed through an excitation filter. So, this is a typical diagram which shows the path of light in a fluorescence microscope. So, from a light source, the light is passed through excitation filter. Now, this excitation filter cuts out all other wavelength of light except the light which is available in the range of excitation spectrum. Excitation spectrum we have just now discussed that it is that range of wavelength of light which is required to create the phenomenon of fluorescence in any fluorophore. And this excitation spectrum is unique for different fluorophores. So, the excitation filter allows the passage of only excitation spectrum light wavelength and this excitation spectrum wavelength light is reflected with the help of a dichroic mirror. Dichroic mirror is a, a very specific optical device which allows reflection of a particular wavelength of light whereas it allows other wavelength of light to directly pass through it. So, the excitation spectrum light is reflected with the help of dichroic mirror and it passes through an objective lens and it then incidences on a sample and the sample has fluorophores. These fluorophores will emit light in a emission spectrum and this emission spectrum will have a wavelength usually longer than the excitation spectrum. So, the light coming from the sample which is now in the range of emission spectrum comes back and now it passes directly through the dichroic mirror. After dichroic mirror, it passes through the emission filter which again allows only the emission spectrum wavelength to pass through it and blocking rest all different wavelengths. So, to the eyepiece or to the camera only those structures are made visible which are being stained with fluorophores. 
and thus the entire the entire structure which is being stained by fluoropholl uh, gets visible in a background which is absolutely dark so this is a basic ray diagram or the basic diagram which represents the movement of light in a fluorescent microscopy so in our next lecture we will try to understand basic principles of these filters uh, the the set of optical instruments also termed as the filter cubes and how these uh, uh, how these optical devices create a much better contrasting image of any object thank you so much for your patient listening